I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour on Capitol Hill is day two of hearings into the collapse of Sam Bankman frieds crypto empire, all while SBF himself is detained in jail in the Bahamas. We have the latest. Plus, Airbnb is working to improve connection between guests and hosts to improve objective bookings. We talked to the company about the findings in its latest anti-discrimination study. Meanwhile, Twitter suspends multiple accounts tracking the private jets of tech titans, world leaders and Elon Musk himself. We speak to the man behind the accounts and get his reaction to being booted from the social media platform. But first, as we do day in, day out, we check in on these markets because today was a macro story. Today was the Federal Reserve once again sounding, perhaps to many, a little bit more hawkish than had been anticipated. Money coming out of tech stocks, therefore, as we think about a Federal Reserve that's still determined to tame inflation. S&P 500 down by 6 tenths percent. The Nasdaq, the tech heavy index, down by almost three quarters of a percent thereabouts. The dollar, even though weakening, maybe there was a little bit for everything and everyone, Ed, because 5.1 percent seems to be the the terminal rate from the Federal Reserve's perspective, how high interest rates will eventually go. But the dollar seemed to think, OK, for the here and now, 50 basis points, yeah. and then maybe slower for the foreseeable. Yeah, that seems the right read. You, when you look across the Nasdaq 100, the different points drags on that index, specific names. It was mega cap that took us lower, the likes of Apple and Nvidia. It's not so much that the Fed raised rates, right? We knew that was going to happen, but very much the outlook or projection from policymakers that we're at 5.1% at the end of next year and then 4.1% cutting down into 2024, probably higher levels than the market was looking for. Interesting, still seeing the US listed shares of China tech remain higher. We're going to talk about the Chinese economy later in the show but there is optimism around that pullback in restrictive COVID policy. Want to quickly look at Bitcoin. We reached 18,000 or breached 18,000 US dollars per token before the Fed decision. That's the first time we've had that level since before FTX's bankruptcy and all of this kind of chaos that happened. But I would point out, of course, after that Fed decision, there was a pullback below that $18,000 per token mark, Cara. Overall, though, we've got to keep an eye on well, fintech, crypto more broadly, as you mentioned, all eyes on what the dollar implications are, but all eyes on what's happening more broadly in the space. And Binance's founder, CZ, he's saying, Ed, look, the outflows from the crypto exchange have stabilized. Still, he's warning employees that the industry's recovery from FTX's own collapse is going to be bumpy. We want to turn our attention to a man who's been in this space a long time. He was in traditional finance. He made the move, of course, to crypto. Is John Wu, president of Ava Labs, for his take on contagion, what the crypto community, I know John calls FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt. There's a lot there of it. And just talk to us about whether or not the contagion that you came on to the show previously and warned about, is it still there? Is it still worrying you? It, it still worries me. It's still there. This thing may or may not be over. But I think the hearings the last two days, and as well as there's some news related to the Binance actually is encouraging. Um, well, first of all, on the hearings, to me, um, the common thread between the congressman and John Ray was that most of the, the number one source of all of the wrongdoings really came from misappropriation of customer funds. And uh, John Ray actually in his opening testimony said it really the best in my opinion. He said the reason why this was able to happen was simply because the power, the decision making, the governance and all the information was held by a small group of inexperienced hands with zero oversight. Um, what I was surprised to not hear at all, frankly, was that in fact, there was uh, a lot of market participation of uh, the participants and operators actually suspect it was Alameda not only leverage the financial balance sheet of FTX, but also information flow and probably front run uh, customers themselves. John, what you're talking about essentially is um, commingling, right? The relationship between FTA, FTX and Alameda, the movement of customer funds, the placement of customer funds. Has well, anything that you've heard in the last 48 hours made you think that, whether it's regulatory or from a legislation standpoint, we'll find a fix to these issues that have been um, uncovered during the course of this uh, saga, I suppose? That, that's a great uh, question, Ed, because, um, you know, uh, the, the result of all of this is taking trust out of the system so there's fewer players, taking leverage out of the system, there's uh, less volume. Uh, in order to get the crypto capital markets back going, this, I think, is actually the first step in build, rebuilding trust. 
You need new leaders, in my opinion, who have seasoned experience, not, opposite what John Ray said of the existing leaders of FTX. You need also regulation. We know 2023 is going to be the year of many bills in crypto. And lastly, I think there are actually companies already working to solve it from a technology perspective. In fact, um, I'm very excited about a company called Enclave. Enclave is a fully um, encrypted exchange on Avalanche. What they have done is create a second layer of security using hardware, the, uh, using the, S, uh, the Intel SGX chip. It's not that different from what iPhone actually does. They create a segregated hardware layer of security. And in this case, customer information, trades, data, are all uh, put into an enclave, a secure hardware enclave, where no third party nor um, the operator themselves can actually get access to it. So therefore, the, uh, the problem that John Ray talked about, centralized control and decision making and yes. misappropriate funds gets taken away. John, that's kind of the systemic or structural issues that I guess, you know, market participants like you have been passing. Uh, you probably heard us at the top of the show talking about the market reaction to the Fed. And all of this makes me feel about what's driving the market right now. If we take a look at Bitcoin, for example, jumping above $18,000 per token just before the Fed, but clearly reacting to it. So what is it? Is it this sort of fixation on FTX and the fallout? Or is the market now slowly returning to, I don't want to use the word fundamentals. I've never found it easy to say when it comes to crypto, but let's just call it fundamentals. There are fundamentals. I think you're referring to valuations being more difficult to understand and justify. But what it highlights is, I think, Ed, what you're pointing out uh, very astutely is that the asset classes in over the last two days performed relatively well and in line with the risk assets on NASDAQ, so to speak, where, however, the equity related crypto companies, maybe a Coinbase, completely underperformed. Um, there are many reasons for that, obviously, because of the FDX and regulation. But frankly, I think uh, a big reason, underlying reason for this is because there are different communities who own the assets. The underlying assets are really part of the crypto native community. They are far more um, less distrusting right now of the space and more enthusiastic. But the equity uh, the stocks that you see are really crossover traffic guys, and they really have uh, very little trust in this space. Again, for crypto as an asset class and as a technology to grow, it, the, the participants need to rebuild that trust. John. Of course, we excuse you for the fact that when you're behind a DeFi kind of protocol and focus, you're going to be talking up the possibilities and some of the security layers that you have apparently being built on there. But I'm interested to go back to sort of a centralization point of view. And you were so great on our show previously when you talked about the contagion concerns you had around, say, Genesis. Talk to us around Binance at the moment, because there are a lot of concerns out there about really the amount of clarity we get from CZ when we talk about the stabilization of outflows. He's been trying to dispel any concerns that he feels have been building around Binance. And they've, all, of course, got I mean, vast quantities of money sitting. And, and overall, the market is huge for them. And the outflows are pretty little compared to the 60 billion, at least, they have in reserves. But are you worried about Binance? I think everyone needs to be somewhat worried. They are a massive major player in the space. Um, but you have to give CZ and Binance some credit. They uh, self-induced um, a, a proof of reserves and, and started creating some sort of transparency scale, of uh, transparency. But obviously, given the FTX situation, the participants in the market probably want even more transparency. So hopefully, we get there. That's one of the reasons why we saw, I think, uh, a, a company called Nansen reported that close to $3 billion of withdrawals in the last day or so from mm. Binance. Um, but if you look at that, it's amazing how the asset class actually increased even with that massive withdrawal. So what that actually tells me is a lot of the stuff moved away from Binance into what I would consider a healthy operational risk management technique from counterparties and into private wallets and cold storage as opposed to dumping yeah. on the market. Lastly, John. What's it like in the ecosystem right now? What is it like when you're trying to build? What is it like in terms of having access to capital to continue to build? So it, it's definitely harder. Um, the, the great momentum we had in terms of building and uh, the business partnerships from traditional finance as well as new developers coming to space was definitely moving far faster and less resistance. 
Right now, there's clearly some people who are uh, hesitating a little bit. But with that said, um, I am still very positive on real utility into this space. I mean, JP Morgan has actually uh, transacted or settled $300 billion worth of repos in the last uh, uh, year or so in a real live environment through their JP Morgan Guardian Onyx uh, project. You've also seen just this last week, you had companies like Porsche announce a, an NFT plan. Now, optically, mm -hmm. that seems just an NFT digital collectible, but you know, behind the scenes, what Porsche really is doing is actually a very smart a way to build younger community aspirational buyers very cheaply with cool NFTs, giving them loyalty engagement so that when they are ready financially, they can go buy the 100, 200,000. Right. Oh, so the lifetime value of that get is actually very good for the low cost that they are uh, creating these so-called NFTs, but it's really more of a lead generating tool in a community build. So there is actual functionality. John Wu, president of Arva Labs. Caroline, helping us kind of join the market moves with kind of what's structurally happening in this industry as a result of FTS. We've got so much more to ask you next time. We'll have you back soon. Coming up, though, over 30 Chinese companies could end up on a trade blacklist. More on that and what it means next. This is Bloomberg. Let's go global for you. Let's zero in on China in particular, because the country's economy is key to so many tech companies around the world, either for supply chain or for reaching consumers, of course. And Bloomberg has just reported overnight that the country's leaders, they are proceeding with a key economic policy meeting this week in Beijing after considering actually delaying it due to a surge in COVID infections. It's all according to sources. That's while we, of course, await more key economic data that could impact the shares of some pretty big names. Alibaba, JD.com. Ed, I know you're on top of this. Yeah, you, you summarize it well because we're looking both on the supply chain side, right? American companies that are impacted by their ability to do business in China, but also the Chinese tech companies themselves. Very shortly, we'll get retail sales data for the month of November. A Bloomberg survey of economists expects a drop of around 4% year on year, an even sharper contraction in retail sales than we saw in the month of November. And why is that key? Why are we talking about Chinese economic data? Because e-commerce is at the heart of that story, right? Singles Day falls in the month of November. We've had some soft but leading indicators of certain markets, EV and cars, for example, fell sharply in the month of November. We saw Alibaba pretty tight-lipped about how singles day actually went, which is kind of an indication that it probably wasn't that good. But as they pull back on the restrictive policy for COVID, and we see actually that the number of cases spread and rise through the country, there is eyes from American tech, eyes from European tech, eyes from the global supply chain towards China on their consumer, but also how they're going to react with policy to what we're seeing and what the, the health of the consumer in that market is. Because right now, pretty mixed picture, Cara. And, of course, a continued pretty murky picture, Ed, when it comes to geopolitics in particular. And we sort of build on your great focus on the consumer to geopolitics in the Biden administration, because it is planning to put more than 30 Chinese companies on a trade blacklist again, which would prevent them from buying certain American components. Of course, that deepens the tensions between the world's two economic superpowers. We've got the perfect guest. It's our own Bloomberg tech executive editor, Tom Giles, here for more. And Tom, just talk to us about this entity list. Memory chips, the focus, it seems here. But what does it mean for these 30 companies? Well, as you said, this is going to put big limits on their ability to, to carry out business with U.S. companies, in particular, purchasing the components that they need to make those chips. The U.S. is really intent on limiting, hamstringing China's ability to become a force in chip making. This is something that the Chinese government has stated over the last several years is a major goal. They're willing to spend hundreds of billions of dollars behind this effort. And the U.S. wants to cut them off at the knees. In particular, they want to interfere with China's ability to make chips and use chips in their war making capabilities in for the Chinese military. That's what the U.S.'s stated goal is. And they are taking step after step after step in order to keep it from happening. What I loved about this reporting, one source telling us that Yangtze memory is kind of one of many on the list, but they're a maker of NAND flash memory. 
lower down in the story want to bring it back to Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. At one time, they were talking to be a supplier to Apple, but it seems like the door's now closed. From the company perspective, this seems to be making life difficult for companies on both sides of this debate. That's right. Yangtze Memory, huge company in China, biggest memory maker in, of chip maker in China, also a potential partner to Apple. Apple saw the writing on the wall. Apple recognized this isn't going to happen. Also a major competitor to Samsung, one of the many companies that China had been pinning its hopes on and continues to pin its hopes on for becoming a major force in chip making. Mm. Um, another, thing to, another thing to remember about this trade war between these two countries and how it's, it's got ripple effects far beyond Silicon Valley, far beyond China, is the effort by the U.S. government to keep Chinese companies from buying the equipment that they need right. to make chips, right? Yeah. So that, that affects uh, the Netherlands and it affects Japan as well. Tom, ultimately, do we prepare for the tit for tat to continue? Do we pre prepare to hear from China? China has already spoken out against this. They say that the U.S. is weaponizing technology as part of this trade war. They're speaking out against it. Um, and I think that their potential to retaliate it remains uh, vast, absolutely. All right, Bloomberg Tech Executive Editor Tom Giles leading the charge here out of San Francisco. Thank you very much. Now, coming up, as addictive as Candy Crush, Duolingo has surged in popularity by gamifying language learning. Now the public company is grappling with, well, how to make money without crossing its fierce following. We'll discuss all of that next with the CEO. This is Bloomberg. About the free language learning app, Duolingo, finds itself perhaps at a bit of a turning point. The company has made a name for itself, engaging more than 56 million monthly subscribers, making learning a new language as addictive as Candy Crush. But now, the newly public company is kind of facing the challenge of becoming maybe profitable while keeping its loyal fan base happy. Joining us now, please to say, the CEO, Luis von Ahn. Luis, talk to us about your mission to develop the best education in the world and make it universally available. How do you turn that into universally available and profitable? Yeah, so we're a very mission-driven company. Um, we started exactly because we wanted to give education to everybody. Um, but over the last you know, five years, we've been um, um, you know, trying to monetize it. And actually, we've been very successful at it. Um, uh, and the way we did that is um, we, whenever you finish a lesson on Duolingo, we put an ad at the end of a lesson. Um, so you can use Duolingo as much as you want, entirely for free, but you may have to see some ads. Um, but if you don't want to see the ads, you can also pay us to subscribe. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out that we make quite a bit of money from the subscription. And actually, um, it's about 7% of our um, monthly active users are paying to subscribe. Uh, but they give us about 75% of our revenue. And this year, we're going to be profitable, at least on an adjusted EBITDA basis. Um, and, and that keeps going better and better. Luis, Caroline set out here in Silicon Valley, at least, a tale as old as time. Millions of users trying to find profit. You even just use the, the ultimate buzzword, adjusted EBITDA. I've heard that from Uber, from Twitter. I mean, the user base, 56 million, is a part of making more money, just growing it. How do you get more people to jump onto this trend of wanting to learn languages, but in a way that's kind of gamified? Yeah, I mean, the main way we grow is we have a, a, a very engaging product. I mean, most of our, our users come through word of mouth. In fact, the vast majority of users come through word of mouth. And it's because the product is very gamified and, and very engaging. We also grow by having, um, we have a really popular TikTok account, if you haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're really good on social media. But it's, it's um, uh, the, the good news is that we don't have to pay to acquire users, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much organic growth. And, and we're growing, we're growing a lot over the last five quarters in a row. We've been accelerating our user growth. Um, so, you know, we're pretty happy with the user growth. And, and that, you're right, that's one of the ways in which uh, we make more money. We basically get m more people to use Duolingo. You make a good point, which is social media. What do you consider Duolingo to be? I mean, is it your aspiration to be like a Facebook, to be like a TikTok, that kind of scale and that kind of daily use? Or, or is it the content that you want to use to differentiate yourself? Uh, we really do think we can get to much larger scale. Um, uh, language learning is pretty interesting. There's about 2 billion people in the world learning a foreign language. Um, 
Duolingo is the largest way to learn a foreign language, but we only have you know, close to 60 million monthly active users. Uh, so we have a lot of room to grow and, and we're growing pretty fast every month. So we think, you know, we, we, think we can get to hundreds of millions of, of monthly active users. Talk to us about R&D and about the way in, use, way in which you use artificial intelligence at the moment. We're all talking about it, ChatGPT and, and the amazing things that it can do. What are the opportunities in AI for you? Um, there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, so Duolingo, um, we've been using AI uh, you know, for the, the last 10 years, um, and we're really big believers in, in using AI to teach. At this point, Duolingo is about as good at teaching as a classroom, mm -hmm. but we're not as good as a one-on-one -on -one human tutor. And our goal is to get Duolingo to be as good at teaching as a one-on-one -on -one human tutor entirely through artificial intelligence. And, and the reason for using artificial intelligence is because it's a lot cheaper to deliver uh, you know, to literally millions of people. And, and we think we can get there. I, think, I mean, I don't know how long it'll take, but we think we can get to as, as good as a one-on-one -on -one human tutor. Former well, professor, professor I'll, I'll take your word from that. I, I'm interested in, therefore, your future and also the way in which you perhaps use your content. You're talking about social media, and Ed asks a smart question about sort of who you see yourself as becoming. What about the actual content you're, you're producing, the people, the characters? Are there other ways in which you monetize that in the future? Uh, well, the main way in which we're going to try to monetize is by teaching. I mean, right now we're doing language learning. We are uh, starting to expand to other things. We're yeah. going to, we just launched a math app. Uh, we have an, an app to teach uh, uh, early literacy. And the idea is we really want to have recognizable characters. I mean, the most recognizable is our green owl. Um, but we have another, uh, a whole other cast of characters. And the idea is kind of to be like the, the app version of maybe Sesame Street or something like that, mm. uh, with, with very recognizable characters that teach you different things. I'll tell you what, Luis, I'll make you a deal. I'll go on the app, I'll try and learn Welsh. I'm the first generation not to speak Welsh in my family. So I'll make you a deal. We'll follow up in a year's time and see how I did. <laughs> Luis Fonan, co-founder and CEO of Duolingo. A lot of people are going to be tweeting me saying, you better follow through on that now. Anyhow, coming up, <laughs> Airbnb is... Mainly your mum, is... Your mum is madly messaging you right now. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, I've fallen into a trap there. Airbnb, fighting discrimination and building inclusion within the Airbnb community. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. And we've got to talk about what is a macro story that affects technology right. today, Ed, and affects hiring within technology as well. We had the Fed chair earlier, of course, Jerome Powell, saying, look, the labor market appears to still be very tight. It's so interesting that you and I talk about day in, day out, the layoffs in technology, and yeah. yet the data doesn't seem to prove it. You know, there's a complete contrast, right? They're trying to get slack in this labor market, slow down growth until that jobs data kind of reflects their goal. And, you know, they're still zeroed in on inflation. It's the same message every time with the same result. We will fight inflation. Here's our outlook and projection for rates. Mm. But at the same time, you know, that it's just so incongruous, the idea of all these jobs openings and every headline you and I talk about, layoffs, cuts, pairing back. It's hard to pass it all. And the idea is that perhaps in the BLS data, what's not showing up, of course, is that the people who are losing their jobs are highly employable. They go on to new roles. They're being snapped up across the board, whether it be by other tech companies, whether it's finance companies, whoever wants to be hiring engineers at the moment, there is still such a desire for them. But I think the market and perhaps the valuation story is also an interesting one for you and I. The fact that these companies, technology companies, are going to be rolling over somewhat if we think that terminal rates are going to be at 5.1%. We've still got yes. more interest rate hikes to come. It's just perhaps the pace is now going to be slightly slower. Yeah, there's also a psychological aspect to it as well. Very quickly, you know, I speak to a lot of venture capitalists who have difference of opinion. They say, mm. well, don't hire people, keep your powder dry. But at the same time, when you do see layoffs, there are people that are talented. They start companies. Look at what happened in 2000, 2008. Yes. They need access to capital to do that. So, you know, it's mixed messages. Uh, we have had some clarity from one name, though. Even mm. after Amazon's biggest round of layoffs ever last month, the company's chief of devices, who's responsible for the likes of the Alexa voice assistant, Echo Speakers, he's pledging the company's still committed to investing big in devices. Here to discuss our global technology head, Brad Stone. 
you lead our coverage at Bloomberg, you know Amazon inside and out. We've reported that there will be layoffs at Amazon, there are layoffs at Amazon, and the devices business has been impacted. You spoke to Dave Limp. Okay, what was the message, I suppose, from him? He sounded a little bit aggrieved that his unit, the devices and services unit at Amazon, has been, forgive the pun, the kind of prime target of this reporting. He's pledging that the layoffs in the devices unit are relatively small. He told uh, my colleague Matt Day and I 2,000, less than 2,000 layoffs spread between the Alexa unit and other groups inside his uh, his, his group, the devices group. Um, he also said that some of the reporting about financial losses in the digital in the uh, devices group were misleading. He talks about basically uh, the, the, the price of the devices being on his P&L, but things like shopping and uh, app sales kind of not accruing to him. So he thought it was a little bit, bit misleading, and he wanted to contest this idea that there was any retreat at all in the ambitions of devices at Amazon. We're looking at some of that interview on the screen, and it, you know I won't read it all out, but it's fighting talk, essentially, that they are doubling down on investment, right? He's saying that if you have a situation where your device is being put away in the drawer, you're not doing well, they want to kind of keep innovating. What else were some of the key takeaways of what he had to say? It wasn't just all focused on no, job no, cuts. No, we, we, we talked about a lot of things. I was very curious about the Astro, that home robot. Okay. They, they introduced that over a year ago, and it's still called this day one edition. He talked about being pretty committed to home robots. Of course, they bought iRobot uh, er earlier in the year. But he talked about the device being stymied by things like a black floor and a, f right. and a, a ceiling to floor ceiling. And uh, uh, sorry, a ceiling to floor window and the sun shining through. So we talked about actually it being still a work in progress and that they're very committed to it. Real quick before I let you go, your newsletter or column was about chat GPT. Caroline and I have been talking about this every single day for a while now. Education. Chat GPT essays. Right. What have you learned? Well, as the father of high schoolers, my first thought was why, you know, this is going to make it very easy to cheat on an essay. And I was wondering how some of the companies that are responsible for providing anti plagiarism tools to schools are going to react to this. So I talked to one called Turn It In. It's actually owned by the company that owns Condé Nast. And they talked about uh, their software essentially being able to identify ch uh, chat GPT essays, but maybe in the future not. And I think it's going to create a really big problem for teachers and schools. We're seeing innovation. We're still seeing job cuts. You know, it's so interesting that Amazon wanted to say this is what we're actually doing in this space. But at the end of the day, they grew very big. And now they're pulling back, thanks to Brad Stone, Bloomberg's head of global technology, Caroline. Yeah, and let's kind of move on to another key company, one that actually Brad has written about extensively, Airbnb, whose CEO Brian Chesky just recently, of course, telling us that they were not planning on any layoffs and they're even stepping on the gas, not on the brakes. But the company's also got another key focus. They're going full steam on and it's inclusion. And joining us now to discuss Airbnb's commitment for diversity and inclusion on the hot on the heels, in fact, of a new report, is Janae Ingram, Airbnb's Director of Community Partner Programs and Engagement, discussing, look, it's a six-year update on how you're trying to fight discrimination, also trying to measure it. And Project Lighthouse is this key partnership you've got with Color of Change. Talk to us about how you're looking to measure, how you're trying to identify bias at the moment, Janae. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, as you mentioned, this has been a six year journey that we've been on to really measure and address discrimination on our platform. And Color of Change is right there at the front of, with us, along with a, a group of other highly esteemed civil rights and privacy organizations. But this is really about understanding what the data is telling us. We didn't want to jump into addressing discrimination without understanding actually what is the discrimination that we're trying to fight and create solutions for. So Project Lighthouse is ultimately the tool that we built and created that gives us that data to help us fight the battle. And at the very opening of this update back in 2016, this focus on sort of tackling discrimination was led by a key civil rights and civil liberties leader, Laura Murphy. And she writes, and it sort of struck me and it's so upsetting, but it's the truth. She says, look, it's in the intractability of discrimination. If it's intractable, what are you kind of trying to do to measure and indeed then to tackle in some ways? What are some of the ways in which you found have worked to educate in some way? Yeah, I, obviously discrimination exists in the world. And, and we know that when we bring people together on a platform like Airbnb, 
that discrimination can happen. But a lot of what we've done is establish what type of community we want to be. So going back to 2016, and you mentioned Laura Murphy, we continue to work with her and others, but we created something called the Community Commitment. And it really is a foundation of how we want our community to engage with one another. And it es essentially says that people and users will not discriminate against others. We've had 2.5 million people decline that community commitment and be removed from our community. So I think in so many ways, this is really about establishing the type of community that we want to have and, and engaging with our users. This is another tool in that toolbox. But I think the other part of it is trainings and bringing people together really does help bring down the discrimination. It, it dispels the biases that we have because it makes people human. They're not, you know, just caricatures of who they are in their racial identity or their other, you know, I identities that they live in. Talk to us about practical ways. I mean, I know in 2018 you removed the ability for hosts, for example, to, to view a guest profile photo before the reservation was made or indeed you can't see it until after it's been agreed to. Yes. What other ways, tangible ways, have you managed to change the way in which we go through a bookings process and that has helped breathe in perhaps more diversity? Well, Instant Book was a, a tool that we created in 2016 and it really was a, a tool that essentially removes bias from the decision-making process that a host has. So it's essentially a way for a guest to book a listing without ever having to be considered on their identity. That said, um, we, we had a goal in 2016 of getting to a million instant book listings. We've far surpassed that. And we're at about 70% of our listings are instant book listings. Mm -hmm. So we've had a real success. And this is a real another tool in our toolbox. With this report, we also are looking at Instant Book and finding ways to make 5 million more people able to use Instant Book. So we, we hope that tools like this and solutions like this will have an impact in addressing discrimination on the platform. Janae, how do you make, for example, those 5 million more eligible? How, how are you seeing your ways and means of doing this being enacted by other companies? What are sort of the practical ways you can do that? Well, in terms of Project Lighthouse, when we built Project Lighthouse, we created a white paper that essentially tells other companies how to do this. Mm. I know that many of our partners that we have worked with to develop, both develop and launch Project Lighthouse and, and who have supported this report that we came out with yesterday, many of them want to see other companies do that. Um, I think for us, it is really about holding ourselves accountable. It's about creating that transparency and maybe serving as a model for other companies that, yes, this data can sometimes be problematic and unacceptable, like our booking success rate gap, but that data can only be addressed when you have the data and you can find the solutions and then continue to measure whether or not the solutions actually have the impact that you want. Janae. We are all about measurement here. Thank you so much for bringing the transparency. Janae Ingram, Airbnb's Director of Community Partner Programs and Engagement. Meanwhile, coming up, let's talk about crypto a little bit more because it's an area that we need to measure and it's an area that perhaps some players are trying to well, bet against, trying to short the fallout of FTX. Hedge funds are now setting their sights on the stablecoin tether. We'll break down why. That's next. This is Bloomberg. So amid the chaos, let's call it, surrounding Sam Bankman fried a handful of hedge funds are now turning their focus back to the crypto industry's perhaps original bogeyman, it's Tether. Warning that that stable coin could be the next crypto catastrophe, maybe one that would make the implosion of FTX look pretty small fry in comparison. Joining us some more is Bloomberg Asset Management reporter Annie Massa, who's just been leading the charge in what hedge funds in particular, Annie, are trying to do to sort of make the most of what is an unbalanced trade in some way, an asymmetric trade, a short on Tether. Talk to us about it. 
Sure. So a bunch of hedge funds have been shorting Tether or at least looking for a way to short Tether. And there are some that have ventured into this realm. Furtree and Viceroy are among them. And others that we mentioned, like Valiant, have looked at the trade, even gotten in, but gotten skittish about it because they're worried about counterparty risk. Tether is the third largest cryptocurrency mm. out there. It's called a stable coin. It's the largest of its kind. It's supposed to always maintain the value of a dollar. So it's a stand-in, basically, for the US dollar in cryptocurrency world. And what some of these hedge funds think is that it could perhaps depeg from the dollar. In large part, and it's interesting, we've just seen the Odd Lots team, Joe Weisenthal, Tracy Alloway, do a great sort of podcast on this as well, that people sort of use it despite itself because in general it has remained tethered to a dollar. It sort of knocked off a little bit during the spring of this year and amid some of the chaos there. But in general, even though we're a bit worried about what really backs it and what really assets are there to be in reserve, it sort of has proved its worth. Why do you think that is and what, what are people kind of worried about here? Exactly. It does, it's been around since 2014, so it's not a new cryptocurrency. What people worry about is the opacity around mm. Tether and the fact that it still remains unaudited. Now, Tether has said that they can't get an audit because big four auditing firms don't want to work with them, don't want to work in the cryptocurrency realm as much. But for whatever reason, it remains unaudited. So there are a lot of questions still about whether it has the reserves that it says it has. The reason that it's important to know that is because people use it assuming any dollar they put in, they get a dollar out. Mm -hmm. Easy as that. And so what, the, what keeps people up at night, let's say, or what Tether Shorts would tell you is if there's any question about whether it could depeg, whether you might not be able to get a dollar out if, if you put a dollar in, yeah. that could be a problem. Hey, Annie, it was fascinating reading your reporting. Sources kind of outlining that a lot of these short positions were established earlier in the year. And then, you know, some funds had second thoughts and they kind of unwound the trade. Some of them got out scar free. Where did the psychology of some of these hedge fund managers lay with Tefa right now? I think it speaks to some of the trust or lack thereof in the system. So one of the ways to short Tether is through a, a counterparty, and Genesis is among the counterparties that have been used in the past to short Tether. So I mean, I think even Tether would tell you this, the people in charge of Tether would say, I mean, it, it hasn't looked like a super attractive trade because some of those very counterparties have had liquidity issues of their own. So it's not exactly an easy trade to put on because if you think that Tether is going to blow up, it could take the entire rest of the ecosystem or a lot of the ecosystem with it. Wow. Thanks to Bloomberg's Annie Massa. Coming up, Elon Musk was after him, allegedly. And now, no more Twitter page. We'll have Jack Sweeney author of the Twitter account Elon Jet, next. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk about Delta Airlines, because it's just boosted its profit outlook. That's even as rivals actually warn a weaker demand. The company still sees strong results in 2023, in spite of the signs of a weaker economy and ongoing supply-side constraints. The CFO, Den Janke, joined us a little bit earlier, following the company's financial outlook and strategic update in New York. Take a listen. I think there's good demand, and the industry continues to be constrained, whether it's labor, whether it's with pilots, whether it's with the equipment manufacturers, the airplanes, the engine makers, and that there's a numerous constraints on the system right now uh, that will strain, constrain growth mm -hmm. uh, to some level as we progress into next year and probably into 2024. Does that frustrate you? No. I think it's, it, there's a good structural backdrop to the industry, good demand, good discipline with capacity uh, that we're in. Uh, a good backdrop. Now, we've been fortunate. We at Delta, we've hired over 25,000 people here over the last 18 months. We've been more in a training cycle. Mm. And it's about building that operational capability and rigor to ensure that we can deliver that capacity in a way that we expect of ourselves, but more importantly, a way that our customers expect of us, that operational performance they've grown accustomed to. On time, clean, with bags. 
Really interesting there from the Delta Airlines Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, it's Dan Janke, Ed, and really talking about also their determination right. to continue to invest, particularly in technology, particularly in R&D. Remember, they made that $60 million investment in Joby, which is sort of a flying okay. taxi. They want to make it easier for you and I to get to the airport, and they don't mind making some big sort of moonshot bets, should we call them? Well, they're kind of like future-proofing. You know, I've spent a lot of time around Joby, and we know it's kind of distance, but at least they're putting their money there for the potential. A headline that crossed the terminal when I was at my desk, Caroline, you're doing that interview, sees no cracks in first-quarter corporate client demand. In other mm. words, those execs in business class seats. Mm. You know how else they get around? How? Those execs, those high-flying executives? Private jet. A so that's what I want to talk about. Just a few of them, and some big names in particular. Now, 20-year-old Jack Sweeney, he himself soared to internet fame and drew the ire of one Elon Musk with his essentially viral Twitter account called Elon's Jet. Earlier this year, Elon offered him $5,000 in exchange for deleting the account, which Sweeney ultimately refused. Now, Wednesday, the account has been suspended on Twitter, along with all of the other accounts that Jack Sweeney operates. And Caroline, I'm delighted to say Jack Sweeney joins us live now. So, so Jack, you operate or were operating a series of accounts which yeah. provide automated updates that track a number of individuals and, and entities by tracking their jets. Twitter suspended all of those accounts today. Could you explain to us what happened? Yeah, so I wake up this morning and uh, first I just see that Elon Jet is, uh, is banned and people, I'm already, it's already going nuts, you know, I'm getting all kinds of notifications. And then slowly I notice that my personal is gone and all the other accounts I run. And the thing is, some of the accounts don't even track the jet of a person. It's like a, an organization like NASA or Boeing or something, experimental aircraft. So. It's really not fitting the same rules as a person yet. He just like went through my account and just clicked ban on all of them. I want to talk about quickly Elon Musk's response to what's happened today. He's taken to Twitter to say that real time posting of someone else's location violates Twitter's doxing policy, but delayed postings of locations are OK. Do you feel or do you acknowledge that what you were doing across those various accounts was a breach of Twitter policy? They just changed that ruling within the past week, and people have just checked on uh, the web archive to see the changing of the wording on their uh, terms, and they've changed it, and then they've just given, given me no warning on the new terms. So they change it and quickly ban my accounts and say I violated it. Are you and going if, to appeal, Jack? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I if I can appeal, then I will, and I will add a delay. But you know, they gave me no opportunity to do so. What about the business behind this, Jack? It's an amazing source of transparency, particularly for journalists and many others. But what about losing money for yourself? Yeah, yeah, I've been trying to build it up and make more of a revenue from it. You know, I've been working on that. There is some amount, but not a crazy amount. But this certainly does not help me. Jack, there is an argument that by tracking Elon Musk's jet, you put him in danger by, you know, he has a huge following. Do you accept that argument? Oh, uh, yeah, somewhat. But I wouldn't say it's like a crazy in danger. You know, if someone's really after him, they can go right to ADSB Exchange's website and track them themselves. Absolutely fascinating conversation with Jack. Let us know. Get in touch. Let us know how the appeal process goes. And if you're looking to pivot the business in any way, Jack Sweeney, founder of Ground Control and Elon Jets, tracking Twitter account. We thank you. Stay well. Meanwhile, I mean, that does it, Ed, for this edition of Bloomberg right. Technology. Uh, it's been astonishing, this show, the news flow. But that Twitter issue is not going away. No. Uh, listen again to what we discussed. Don't forget our podcast, of course. Find it on the Bloomberg Terminal, on Apple, on Spotify, yeah. and also iHeart. Yeah. Wow. This and is Ed, I, I was going to say, Ed, I think they can also go and probably watch that interview again with Jack Hay from on, on Twitter or on TikTok or wherever you follow us on Instagram. But just kudos to you for a quick shout out because you just always are scoop master bringing us all these sort of news. And thank you for bringing that interview with Jack because you've built that relationship with him. And yeah, he's probably a bit upended right now, right? So busy and traumatic as the news flow, news flow been today. I was trying to get out of the show early. Sorry well, about that, aren't, you, uh, aren't you about to head off and take some time off? Some well-earned rest? I am.
but I'll be back very soon. Just watch, this is Bloomberg.